Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Thanks for the invitation from uh, Igeas. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, with uh, such a full room. I'm not used to it. Um, right. Um, let's get started. Okay, between the late 4th and the late 3rd millennia BC, Crete was transformed from an egalitarian landscape of hamlets and villages to one where forms of livelihood and trajectories of development differed often dramatically between communities and regions, where inequalities could be sharp and enduring, and where cultures of consumption were geared towards the marking of difference. In other words, during the space of a millennium, Crete had in certain respects come to look more like modern Western societies. And this resemblance has demanded ex investigation and research into what uh, was termed the Bronze Age has been wrestling with the so-called emergence of civilization, seeking insights into a history of human progress. Um, Arthur Evans claimed the role of interpreter and established a particular vision of, its, uh, uh, of the development of Minoan civilization. And in his scheme, at least, emergence takes place early, that is, at the beginning of EM1. And EM is therefore not a formative phase prior to the emergence of civilization in MM1, as we have come accustomed to think, but a phase in the development of a civilization that had already emerged. The complexity of Minoan civilization was seen as developing gradually during EM, largely under the weight of its own internally driven momentum, but also stimulated by specific transformative links with other East Mediterranean civilizations. An alternative model, originating first in the work of Gordon Child, takes issue with the notion that EM Crete was sufficiently complex to qualify to be termed a civilization, and instead views EM as no more than a formative phase predating civilization. In this view, civilization emerges later, not in EM1, but in or around Middle Minoan 1, at the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age, that is, in a rapid revolutionary phase of reconfiguration, marked by the uh, apparently sudden appearance of palaces, rulers, and a ranked or class-based society. And this alternative vision is typ typified by the notion of an MM1 horizon or revolution. Now, the fact that it's possible for two quite different visions of the emergence of Minoan civilization to continue to exist side by side, as they do, tells us uh, many things, but there's two that I want to focus on. Firstly, uh, the possibility for competing visions uh, based on the same data set shows that these models, or at least as they were first proposed by Evans and Child, are essentially rhetorical in nature, relying on a preconceived narrative to bring order and logic to the data, rather than allowing closely defined patterning in the data to lead the way. Secondly, the second realization is that despite the tremendous increase in knowledge of EM settlement and funerary contexts that has taken place over the last four decades, there are still serious gaps in the data where the picture is equivocal or unclear. And I would like to suggest that the most serious of these gaps concerns our ignorance, at least our ignorance until relatively recently, of the nature and degree of complexity in the largest EM communities and how this uh, complexity may or may not, depending on whether you believe in it, have evolved up to the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age. Ever since Evans, the orthodoxy has been that levelling and terracing activity in advance of palatial construction uh, during Middle Minoan I at these sites has disrupted or removed traces of EM activity uh, at these sites, apart from the odd fragment here and there. And in general, the picture had seemed too fragmentary to allow for further insights into the evolution of complexity at these sites during EM. So we just didn't know, basically, what was going on. What has been less widely appreciated is that this seemingly small gap um, in our sample of uh, EM sites translates into a major potential gap in our sample of EM complexity. As has long been appreciated, Knossos, Festos, and Malia are among a very small number of settlements to exceed the size and organizational threshold of villages and embark upon a process of uh, growth that we could perhaps label it urbanization well before the end of the EM period. Ironically, therefore, it is at the very locations where we might confidently expect 
to encounter what you might call top-end EM complexity that we similarly lack the possibility for insight. And perfecting this irony is the fact that our knowledge of smaller and thus organizationally less complex sites has been steadily increasing at a, at a, at a, rapid, a rapid pace, um, feeding the illusion that our sample is complete and thus, and thus representative. And so because, of this, because this irony is excellentio, discussions of EM complexity have been free either to recognize it and thus factor in the possibility of unappreciated forms of greater complexity at a handful of, at a handful of sites, or to ignore it and thus form a more pessimistic view of the, com the extent of EM complexity. And both views can still be found uh, in the literature today. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about Knossos. And... I'm going to give a, a very, very brief overview of our um, uh, work, that's a, of, of, of work that has been done over the last, um, let's say, 20, 30 years, or, and what our EM sample sort of uh, looks like or look like. So we have the palace well, and this is going to be very brief, um, a, little, a little deposit that, uh, that, that gives us a, a window on something at least, and Peter Day and David Wilson have uh, suggested that the Kafala Hill, on the basis of the palace, well, that, was, uh, that the Kafala Hill was already a venue for special ceremonies involving consumption of uh, drink by the late EM. Then, of course, we have the uh, Westcourt House in EM2A. That's a large, uh, originally two-story house that sat beside an open court to the west, but uh, <laughs> we can't really contextualise it very easily. It, was it uh, unusually large for the, uh, for the time, or was it... Uh, uh, just similar to other houses uh, around the hill. We just don't know because uh, we, we don't really have a very big sample of houses uh, at all at Knossos and certainly not around the hill. Then there's the south front terrace, uh, south, uh, uh, the, the south front of the, the, the later palace, and uh, some houses there. Again, uh, useful little windows, but kind of not necessarily telling us um, a great deal of how the site as a whole was operating. And then, of course, the uh, Northwest Terrace, uh, which, thanks to excavations by Evans and then later by Sinclair Hood, uh, has uh, been clearly dated to EM3. And uh, Hood himself has claimed that this uh, was part of an earlier palace, but this has been disputed by others. And it is now also clear that the uh, enigmatic subterranean structure that Evans called the Early Keep was also constructed in EM3. So it's not really clear how these fragments that are so isolated in space and time actually relate to each other. We kind of just have too few pieces of the puzzle. And the prospects for a solution that seems slim, uh, at least until very recently, not least because of the widespread belief following Evans that the summit of the Kafala Hill had been extensively levelled at the start of MM1 in order to build the first palace. This later levelling was presumed to have rem removed all traces of EM activity from the summit of the hill. Right. Okay, so... Oops, that was a good effect. Um, so how did we get to this point in Middleman M1 B? So the, one of the implications, as I've said, is that uh, final layer thick to EM must be missing from the hilltop. We have uh, FN4, very latest Neolithic uh, houses on, uh, that were excavated below the central court by Evans himself. And then we seem to have a gap um, until the first uh, palace building. And I didn't really expect to be addressing this question at all when I uh, started uh, working on uh, Arthur Evans's excavations. Um, I was interested in piecing together where all the Neolithic tests were dug because there were so many tests that had produced Neolithic material and I thought it was a great pity that, we, that this, they couldn't be uh, brought into the uh, work I've been doing on um, publishing uh, Neolithic Knossos. And so it started, began as a pilot study to sort out uh, the, a lot, potentially large data set uh, that I could use for my Neolithic work. But then in the process of trying to sort out um, uh, the tests and, and to find out where they were excavated, I realised I had to pay attention to uh, more than just the Neolithic. I had to pay attention to the full extent of the, the sequence in each test to be sure that I had actually got the right boxes going with the right test. 
So then I started doing a lot of archival work and collating publica publications that, uh, that mention the tests. I also looked at the uh, contents of the uh, Evans boxes and then eventually ended up going through every box um, that has Neolithic or later uh, material in it, or basically Neolithic material is pretty much in, in every box, but I paid attention to the Minoan uh, uh, parts of each test as well. And in order to, uh, to control the, I mean, I drove myself mad uh, trying to think in three dimensions uh, and relating tests in space, and obviously GIS is, is a perfect tool to uh, uh, address this and, and help me uh, with this. So I've started working uh, in, uh, with, with GIS to help visualize uh, things in three dimensions. Then we we're lucky enough to get uh, permission uh, to do a geophysical survey in 2009. And we're still uh, processing the evidence from that, but uh, we got some very, very good results. And that has helped uh, uh, fill out some of the gaps as well. And then finally, and this, was kind of, I was, this wasn't something I planned to do, but it, I ended up doing it when I was, I was kind of hanging around with, while well, this guy towed this funny thing around, taking the geophysics. And I was actually spending time in the palace that I, I haven't actually really done. And so I've been studying all these tests up in the Stratigraphic Museum I'm not actually thinking or even looking at the spaces where they were excavated. And this turned out to be quite a revelation because I started to see um, walls that uh, I'd already sort of reconstructed in my head when you can spot a, a terrace wall um, when you're comparing tests. But I just thought the terrace wall would be buried. But then I started to spot them on the site. And that led me into uh, a very unexpected uh, part of the research, which was um, exploring EM uh, features and walls that were actually on the hill. And so contrary to what was, one would expect. And so there was a lot of on-site recording and mapping, etc. Okay, um, my work on the Neolithic also sort of helped out in the sense that having finally got on top of the uh, Neolithic FN chronology, I was in a position to actually start to understand a bit better what was going on at the site before early Minoan happened. And so uh, it turned out to be particularly interesting uh, some things that were happening in FN4. And it's turned out to be a very, very interesting phase. I mean, it's a phase that I would almost want to call EM0 if I could ever have a chance of getting away with it. But it, I think it, it's more helpful to think about it in those terms rather than Neolithic. But FN4 we're stuck with. And, uh, and that's the way it'll have to stay. Um, so... FN phasing has been clarified. I've reviewed and reassembled a lot of the tests, and now I have an idea of where they were excavated in space, which is obviously very important for interpreting them. Um, also, in the process of reviewing, came across additional EM features and deposits. And as I said, the geophysical survey has added some new information. Um, oops, that was... What did I do there? Okay. Okay, you're seeing it all in reverse. <laughs> right, I think I pressed end. That was not very clever. Okay, so the first thing that I realized was that the hill was not leveled in Middle Minoan 1. It was leveled at the end of the Neolithic. And this leveling episode can be picked up very, very neatly in the central court stratigraphy, the well-recorded stratigraphy from the uh, John Evans excavations. And by a lot of, a lot of pain, actually, um, piecing together the excavations, uh, the old ones of Arthur Evans, the, new, uh, the more recent ones of uh, uh, John Evans, I was able to come up with a, a glimpse of what was going on in the court um, before we lose, basically, the Neolithic stratigraphy. And so there were two phases. Uh, Firstly, one that uh, is Final Neolithic 4 in date. And there's the house excavated by Evans, but there's also a house to the north, which we've got a corner of and some, some small deposits that just about allow you to, well, they allow you to link to date it to this, this phase. But also, interestingly, there's, a lot, there's a, a lot of open space, and there's a terrace wall uh, that gets put in, and a, and a fill is deposited, so that the hill is levelled, and uh, the debris from uh, the levelling gets thrown into this area, which was lower lying, retained by a terrace wall. And then on that uh, sort of terrace, there was uh, an open space um, that seems to have 
been repeatedly renewed and, and curated, let's say, and, but kept very clear, but frustratingly, apart from uh, some halves, which turned out to be fixed between the, uh, the, the phase one of this and, let's say, in the phase two. And likewise, imagine phase two is extremely uh, uh, thinly stratified, um, but there's just enough to see that the, the house to the north goes into a, a second phase, and the halves continue in the same spot, and then there's a replacement or a, a successor to House J. And this phase, uh, the second phase, as, far, as, 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 as much as one can tell, it, it begins in FN4, but it has this EM1 material stratified um, uh, before we lose that, uh, that, that image of activity. And so, OK, I'll maybe optimistically call this a court, but I think you'll see why I'm calling it a court already here, because of what it goes on to become. But it is unusual. It's, uh, it's a leveled space. There's use of terrace walls, and throughout the Neolithic, they're not really uh, using terrace walls, and certainly not sort of sculpting the hill. It rather just accumulates, accumulates, accumulates. And so the use of terrace walls, which is something very familiar to, to Bronze Age uh, archaeologists working at Knossos, is something that, that kind of that process begins in FN4. And then we've got this regularized rectangular form. Um, there was regular clearance. And then there's the fixed halves. So made that point. Oh, I've done it again. Damn it. <laughs> right. I'm going to do it differently. OK, and the other thing I'd like to point out, again because it will become important, is that there's an establishment of an orientation by the terrace wall of this court and by the eastern uh, facade of the houses that are associated with it in FM4 that is followed by the later palace and um, uh, the later palace spaces and walls. And so that orientation, again, is, goes back to FN4. And just want to uh, reference the work of Simona Todaro and Serena di Tonto at Festos, um, where something similar seems to be happening. Not the same, but something similar. I mean, lucky for them, there's activity associated in, uh, in two, two open spaces, um, sort of one not far from the, around the area of the West Court, later West Court, and one sort of overlapping at least with the, uh, the Central Court. And they left the stuff in situ. And they also had fixed halves. And so there is, there is a degree of similarity. But because they have uh, deposits in situ, they have fantastic evidence for what was going on, which was basically large-scale group commensality, very large scale. OK, so to sort of try and draw together these fragments a bit, um, you've got the beginning of EM1, you've got this final phase in the court and, and the houses. There's also a western open area below the west court, um, which, was, which looks like it's open from FN3, and it's characterized not by a leveled area, but it's just an open space, but with these large pits uh, that are sort of repeatedly, uh, they're sort of filled partly and then repeatedly redug. And so these, these pits go on into EM1. And so in the space, and to the north, there is evidence by, by comparing tests that were, were dug by, by Evans and seeing where, where natural, uh, where, sorry, where the Neolithic uh, exists, it's very apparent, and it's been apparent to, obviously to, to David Wilson, who, uh, who did, conducted the study, that you've got shifts in levels. But if you plot them all together, um, you, you, you can see that there is a, basically a terracing operation that goes on, and the, the lowest stratified Bronze Age material on Neolithic in those all these tests, and we have quite a lot from the uh, the north north part of the below the north part of the palace. The lowest material is EM1 and looks quite early EM1 um, in date. And so you have a sort of situation with houses on top of the hill, and then lower terraces. And once you have terraces, then you obviously you have ramps and more restricted access. And with a degree of license, if you, if you, if you take the uh, FN4 house, which we have the largest portion of, and you 
take the space between that and the next house and you sort of multiply it across the hill, then, I mean, I've, I've just put four, but you, you could have maybe six at a squeeze, but it's a limited uh, number of houses that are on the hill associated with this court. And so um, I am sort of would like to sort of suggest that we've got already maybe some sort of emerging inequalities at Knossos taking place from FN4 and into EM1. And so you have the, uh, there's a western open area, the, the eastern court, the space between them is restricted. And I think this is, this may be one way of seeing how the inequalities that you inevitably form in, in human societies, you can spot them in the Neolithic, but they, ne they never endure. Um, they don't seem to be passed on to the next generation. But by creating this space, this central place on the hilltop, then you can not only create hierarchies of access that were only increased when the uh, terracing went in on the north slope in EM1, um, but you get inequalities in access to, to place. And um, I think this is a mechanism for the stabilization of inequalities, because inequality then becomes something you can inherit via a transfer of property. And so it starts to become something intergenerational. And the privileged few that lived on the hill in proximity to you know, certain <coughs> ceremonial spaces were able to um, pass that, on, that privilege on to their, their descendants by passing on the houses. OK, so the wider EM1 settlement seems to be broadly confined to the, 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 the slopes of the, uh, uh, the, the Kafala Hill. It doesn't seem to have gotten any bigger than the, the Neolithic settlement, though it's quite difficult to uh, really be, be certain about that. But we know that it's, uh, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't grow beyond the hill like it does in EM2. Now, one of the things that's come, come to light more recently is through the GIS work, um, and I thought it would be a, a fun idea to uh, take all the uh, evident, uh, the, the elevation data for when natural was hit um, in all the tests, put it together, run an interpolation so that we can uh, sort of see how the hill looked in the Neolithic. And it was a bit before the Neolithic uh, 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 settlers came and lived there. And this was useful for me in the Neolithic. And I never really expected it to be anything other than uh, that. But then we, I came across certain anomalies um, which um, show that to the west, there's a, an area that seems to, it basically, it seems to have been a, a sort of a, a massive cutting uh, dug to, to the west of the hill. Just that, I mean, the, if I showed you the interpolation without these points on, then you have a nice um, a sort of shallow, and you can see that each one of those is a meter. So it's suddenly shooting off down um, uh, several meters after a, a certain point. So it's a very, very sharp um, anomaly that cannot be natural. And uh, Sinclair Hood, in his Royal Road South excavations, um, basically took uh, uh, soundings that both uh, to found EM material higher up um, and then uh, lower down to the uh, west, there was the, what's, what beca what's become known as the Royal Road South Fill, which is a middle Minoan 1A in date, a massive fill that was deposited essentially to fill up this ditch. And so what's become apparent from the, the GIS data is that there's a series of anomalies that seem to mark out what you, with a bit of artistic license, um, Call the ditch. Okay, what's the date of this? Well, it's uh, prior to Middleman and One A, and Peter Warren, one of Peter Warren's walls, uh, EM two walls from his Royal Road South excavations, appears to go down into this ditch, and so I think it's probably pre predates EM two A, and it also it seems to enclose the the area actually of the uh, Neolithic to EM one uh, settlement, and sort of it only really makes sense. Uh, to, to dig it before the town uh, or the settlement expands out to the west as it does in EM2A. And so I'm, I would sort of put it in the range of uh, FM4 or EM1, the digging of this large ditch, which would have effectively uh, meant that this was much better defended because at the moment there was just a, a shallow saddle. Uh, prior to digging the ditch, there was just a sort of saddle that would have been make it vulnerable to uh, attack from, from uh, the west. Okay, so... Moving through EM1, there is evidence for, and this is why that, that final phase is so poorly stratified, is that they, 
uh, they, the, the houses were basically demolished, almost effectively down to their foundations and beyond. And a levelling fill was deposited. And you, I picked this up in all the tests in the central court. And at the same time, there is uh, uh, evidence for a terrace wall uh, to the east, which um, has a, there's a fill behind it with EM1 uh, material in it. And on the geophysics we did, you can spot that terrace wall, continuing down to uh, a wall at the southern end of the central court that you, that you can still see today. Okay, so this is the film, that's what it looks like, horrible stuff. But when you uh, sort it, then you find that there's obviously a, a, a whole heap of uh, Neolithic material. Interestingly, also, one or two early Neolithic and Middle Neolithic sherds suggesting that at that point, there's some big cuttings being made into the Neolithic somewhere else to release that material, because otherwise that is very well buried otherwise. And then the latest material is EM1B. Uh, now, to the west of this, I've, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a previous paper, I've argued for the pro probable existence of some sort of central building. And I believe that these are the walls that go with it. They, are, they basically were treated as foundation <coughs> walls where, by Evans and Mackenzie. But it's clear that if they are foundation walls, then they have their own foundation. So the stone walls sit in cuttings into the surface of the hill uh, that are actually rammed with clay. And investigations by uh, Mackenzie in 1923 in the, in the area south of the Central Palace Sanctuary uh, was, was able to plot quite a few of these, these earlier walls. And they're in places where no Middle Minoan, some of them are in places where no Middle Minoan or Late Minoan walls, so they don't really make sense as foundations. And the classic one is the one that blocks the um, long corridor of the magazines. And so if it had a wall on it, then that corridor would basically, basically not function. And some, I would argue, stand above floor level. And there's little fragments, this one, the north wall of the throne room system, which just happened to escape uh, the otherwise pretty fundamental remodeling of this area in Middle Minoan III. And so the, the dating evidence is restricted to one or two deposits. And the best one, the clearest one, is from the 1987 throne room tests, um, in which a, a cutting uh, was uh, found underneath uh, uh, a later Middle Minoan, uh, Middle Minoan three or Late Minoan one wall. Colin will be able to correct me on that. But the key thing was there was a there was a, a cutting filled with um, very fresh looking EM one pottery, which the latest of which is like the Palace Well group, and so late in EM one. And so, I propose. This earlier building, it was clearly an earlier building there with these, with these sort of rubble walls. I would propose that that wall is EM1B in its original date. And so putting these fragments together, you have something like this. Maybe one building, maybe two buildings, not entirely clear. Um, and so if we have a court building at Knossos in EM1B, then this and, and a, a large open space next to it. The open space is much clearer that the, we, we have this because of the, uh, the, the extent of the fill across the, the, the later central court. Then maybe we have a context for these drinking ceremonies that Peter Day and David Wilson have been, been talking about. Okay, so um, piecing it together, we have something like this. And as I say, I've drawn it as one central building, but maybe it could be two. Um, so moving into the EM2, we can see several lines of access which you can spot. And, and so these also are sort of marking out the footprint of this, this building. So that we have a, a ramp that was part of which was excavated by Sinclair Hood, and that's dated without any question to EM2A, and is actually then at a there's, a there's an EM, I think it's stratified under EM3 material. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an early ramp that's uh, being constructed in EM2A and it's along the line of the long corridor of the magazines. And then there's a, an entrance to the south, which we don't, there's no uh, dating evidence, but the masonry is basically looks early uh, like 
all the, uh, the other early walls, uh, early Minoan walls. And just, just, for, just to show, there's the West Court House that we have there in EM2A. And just see the orientation of that is not the same as the court and the building. And it seems that the orientation of houses on the lower slopes of the hill is, not, does not, uh, is different to the uh, central building. Now, there are other fragments of structures that come to light with this work, and they seem to show the existence of peripheral buildings on the same alignment as the central building and the court, and the earliest of these peripheral buildings can be dated by deposits to EM2A late and EM2B. And the first of these, the earliest of these, is um, to the east of the, the northern end of the Long Corridor. And this is uh, a sketch plan by Fife. Not a sketch plan, actually, a plan with some sketches and annotations by Fife. One of those incredible things when you find it, it's got some of the tests are marked on it, and that's actually the only source for the location of some of the tests that were dug. And so he's drawn in this feature because there was a test that was dug here um, and the material was studied by David Wilson and he's uh, dated it to EM2A late. Um, but by collating all the archival uh, material, um, we're able to, I spotted that, or realised that there was a wall that was found in that, in, that in that test and the wall is on the same alignment as the later palace. So that wall is basically the foundation wall of a wall that stood higher up. And the fill is because this was a lower terrace, and in order to build a, a structure at a higher level, at the level at which actually this, the court was, they had to first build their foundations on, at, at the lower level and then fill the area up. So otherwise, the, if they just fill, put the fill in and then put the wall on, then the wall would sink. And so they were well aware of, of how to build up uh, uh, like that in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a secure way. So that, that, is a, that's, that, orient that wall is definitely into a late in date. And it aligns with a wall here, which uh, seems to have a sort of corner here. And it's in this early masonry style. And so I'm suggesting that this is also EM2A late in date. Um, I've mentioned the ramp, so I don't think I need to uh, go on. And then, I've mentioned, and then there was this southern entrance uh, lining up with uh, the northern ramp. And again, I don't have any... Uh, ceramic evidence for this, but the masonry is very obviously uh, a sort of similar style. And there's a corner here. So uh, when it was originally built, there was a corner here, and it went, goes into underneath the area of the, uh, of the South Propylon. So an interesting, it would be an interesting area to do tests if, uh, if that was, uh, were to ever prove possible. Um, and then to the north, and this is, a, this is a, a whole series of deposits were excavated from below the northwest portico, which um, I would date to early in EM2B. And the deposits themselves are very interesting, but what's interesting is that they sit behind, they effectively date these early looking walls that are existing at a, a very low level. Uh, they're excavated by uh, Arthur Evans, um, and call, considered a palatial, a palatial uh, foundations. Um, and I think, well, the, these, the deposit that's behind them uh, goes with them, and, and the deposit is sitting on the floor that seems to be about the right level for the, the sort of the lowest part of the wall. And so this, to me, looks like an EM2B wall. So this is an EM2B building that's effectively uh, sitting directly below and on the same alignment as uh, the later facade, north facade of the palace. And you can trace these, uh, these lower walls also underneath the north lustral area, which you see, see uh, here. And there's even a curved corner uh, that seems to have been later blocked. So maybe one of those curved entrances that, uh, uh, that we heard about first from Evans um, in below the West Court, I mean, in the West Court, that he considered to be part of the earliest palace. 
And so the deposit below the um, north portico is um, char characterized by um, uh, pottery that's it's clearly been, um, it's like a sort of redeposited primary assemblage. So the pottery, if we had excavated the whole of this deposit, then we'd probably be able to mend up completely, uh, complete shapes. But at the moment, it's, uh, it's not really possible to do more than uh, mend up very, very uh, large fragments. But David Wilson recently published a ceiling that comes from this deposit, not from Evans's uh, test, but actually from Nicholas Platon's test. And so this is our, our best dated, earliest uh, Ceiling at Knossos, it's, uh, I, would, I would place it early in EM2B. And uh, makes me think of the, um, the ceiling from uh, the building below the Malia Palace, the building that have, seems to have a court and seems to share the same uh, orientation as the walls of uh, the later palace at Malia. And there was a ceiling from that building as well. And then the other thing that really struck me was this massive pithos. Now, uh, in, in going through the tests, I've encountered uh, pithos uh, fabric and uh, pith pithoid uh, jars of EM2B dates from other deposits outside the palace, and they're of a, of a certain sort of small size, or sort of small pithos, let's say. This is massive. This is, um, I forget now exactly how thick they are, but the, the base you'll see, this is just a, a corner of, of a part of a base. And so I don't know how big these jars would have been. Colin would know uh, better about uh, comparing them across to... Uh, to, uh, to uh, later neopalatial uh, uh, pithoi. Uh, pitho um, but we're talking about very, very large vessel that is not what uh, uh, the like the pithoi in the same fabric, but not the same size by any means as the pithoi from, uh, from, let's say, the south front houses. And so I think this is, there's something unusual about this assemblage that comes from this building. Um, and then very quickly, there's evidence in the form of Again, a fill going in and a, uh, that seems to be behind an earlier wall system that lies behind the northwest terrace, which would be uh, EM2B in date. And so possibly we've got uh, uh, another structure going in there. Again, it seems to be on the same alignment. And so, I mean, there's other evidence as well, but those are really the best dated uh, uh, indications. And the settlement then at the end of EM2, as, as Todd Whitelaw has shown, had reached a minimum of six hectares. So we've got something considerably bigger than uh, the Neolithic village. There's, uh, well, there's, a, there's a very intriguing test uh, from north of the theatrical area that has a EM2A triple kernels published by Wilson. And I've, I've, I've had the dubious pleasure of, of pretty much seeing all early Minoan material from all tests at Knossos. And that's the only example of one of those. And it puts me in mind of the, the type of objects that you get in funerary context. There's also a bit of a stone vase, and so, and it just, the, the test itself happens to be just on the edge of the uh, scatter uh, plotted by Todd Whitelaw. And so I think this is quite a, a, a good candidate for where at least one uh, cemetery uh, would have been at this time. Later, obviously, just swallowed up in the expansion of the settlement. And um, I'm so I apologize for not uh, giving you a nice plan where I've traced out all the, the walls, and it looks a bit like a sort of whiteout mass, but uh, under the right to visualization, this is a kind of an old slide that I need to update, but we have definite evidence for structures below uh, the uh, Royal Road going out west, and then under the area, the theatrical area, and where we, where we lose them is where I would expect to lose them um, here, which is the area of the theatrical area. We have tests have shown that the natural is very, very high at that point. There's a sort of spur from the hill coming out. And the natural is very, very high. And so there was obviously some levelling that took place um, prior to the uh, construction of the uh, theatrical area, or at least a, a court on its, uh, in its location, that kind of chopped off the higher-lying uh, higher early Minoan houses, but where they're lower-lying, uh, you get these walls appearing. And these seem to be... Uh, it seems to be a quite dense mass of, uh, of walls, but they, they don't have, they're not in use for a long time, according to uh, the uh, tests. Uh, the tests are pretty much EM2, and there's maybe a little bit of EM1 in, uh, as you come closer into the hill. And so it seems pretty clear that these structures are going to be EM2 in date, maybe some EM1 wall as we come in closer. So this is kind of a, a hint or an idea of what the, 
the settlement may have looked like. And when the, geo the geophysical data is more, is more processed, then hopefully we can, can show a more convincing sort of plan. And so I, I, I think it's quite useful. I mean, people will probably disagree, but I think it's quite useful to see this expansion that takes place in EM2 as the beginning of, it clearly is the um, part of the same rapid expansion that we call urbanization at a later point. And I think it makes sense to actually think about this as urbanization from the start rather than exclude it from the, from the discussion. And so in order to try and show at least how I'm seeing these buildings operating, obviously I don't have huge amounts of evidence for, for some of them, but there are fragments here and there. I can't I don't really want to bore you with all the, the details, but it will end up in our final publication at some point. But I think that this is what the building we could look like, schematically at least, at the end of EM2. And so, again, going back to what David Wilson and Peter Day have been saying, you know, they've spotted a change in the uh, apparatus of, of drinking that takes place in EM2A, actually sort of EM2A late, really. You have the appearance of the footed goblet, and people who work at Knossos and look at uh, Evans's deposits and uh, other excavations are obviously very, very familiar with this, this footed goblet. It goes on and on and on and on uh, into Middle Minoan. And it's kind of our best dating tool for deposits. But this um, appearance of this individual drinking cup uh, takes place in EM2A, uh, late, at around at the same time as the first of these peripheral buildings appears. And so I think that uh, that is significant, what uh, David Wilson and Peter Day first noticed, and that it's, it, it may be a way of, uh, of understanding what these, what these buildings may have been. So why, why repeat these buildings through space? Um, I think there may be some sort of corporate buildings some, uh, sort of, uh, to, that, are, that are being used by uh, sort of groups in the uh, Knossos settlement that are larger than households. And that the, the goblet is, a, and, and, the, and the way that that goblet facilitates groups of a larger size all drinking together, whereas the EM1 chalice, as, 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 as has been pointed out, is one for sharing around in a relatively small group. But here, you, with the goblet, you can literally have any large uh, group. And so it's maybe favor, favor, favoring larger, cor more, what I would call corporate commensal units. That's an idea, isn't it? Um, and then finally now, we can see a bit of context for the Northwest Terrace Wall, which then becomes a sort of, um, basically a sort of rebuild of an EM2B Northwest peripheral building. And I believe, I mean, this wall is, is built in a very nice masonry style. It's a metre thick, at least, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And I think it's much, obviously much more than a terrace, but actually the, the, the lower part is a terrace, but the, it would also have gone up to be a facade wall for a structure, a building, as Sinclair Hood uh, suggested all those years ago. And as I said, the, uh, the, the early keep can be also put in this uh, period, as has already been suggested. And uh, I think Colin noticed that the masonry of the... Of the uh, inside the, the early keep is actually very similar to the Northwest Terrace. And, and this is, a, this is an, an observation I think Evans also uh, made. And the, the, the clincher really is the very, very deep fill. I, 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 I got all these, there's many, many tests, and I got very excited when I, because uh, I'm interested in the Neolithic, thinking, well, we're going to have some lots of nice Neolithic pottery and lots of nice stratigraphy. Well, uh, maybe not so nicely recorded, but still I thought it would be useful for me. And it turns out that it's a complete mixture of Middle Neolithic through to EM3 material from top to bottom, which is logical because that, the, a cutting would have had to be made for the uh, early keep. And this fill, well, material that's from, from that cutting, was dumped behind the walls. And so there's no doubt, in my mind at least, of the EM3 date of that structure. And so if you take all these walls, you can sort of see a, an evolution in styles. There's the... EM1B north wall of the central building, which seems to be actually, I, I was thinking about this the other day, it's almost like it's reused masonry. And it kind of wondered, well, maybe, maybe the houses that were demolished uh, to, prior to the, to, to the laying out of the larger court, I wonder whether some of the masonry of the houses actually got used in uh, this building. It's a thought, anyhow, that occurred to me. 
Um, and then in EM2 L8, again, a sort of rubble style, very, very simple. And, but then in EM2B, the north portico wall has sort of shaped uh, blocks that are not dissimilar, I don't think, to the EM3 northwest terrace, the difference being that they're, they're also filling uh, sort of little stones in between. But I think there's maybe, uh, there'd almost be another argument for its EM2B date. It seems slightly simpler, but there is a certain degree of quarrying and shaping of those uh, stones. Uh, so just to, just to complete the story, I'm not going to go into any detail on it, but the Middle Minoan 1A court complex sees a massive construction of a series of structures on the uh, east wing. Okay, so concluding remarks. Um, I think firstly, we have a radically different picture now of the origins and the emergence of the palace. I don't, you don't necessarily have to buy everything I'm saying to see that there is, there is, there is something going on there um, earlier and there are, that some of these uh, rubble walls are dated, um, and, and so they, they are early Minoan in date. And so however you uh, want to interpret them, there are certain key uh, things that they share in common with the palace. Not least, but some of them are actually incorporated in the later palace, but also they have similar alignments as uh, later pa palace walls. And so I would like to suggest that the Middle Minoan Palace was not constructed in a single sudden massive expenditure of resources in Middle Minoan I, but rather the court complex evolved through multiple smaller episodes of investment that actually begins in FN4. We don't have a structure there, but we have the open space, and the process of investment uh, is, uh, begins there. So there's no single Daedalus, no single design, no single building program, no single first palace, really, no point at which a first palace could be said to have been completed. So we have to, I think, drop that idea entirely, at least in terms of the origins and emergence of the palace. It may make sense for later, re uh, later construction and, and the, the big change that took place in MM3 has been, uh, and LM1, has, as has been suggested, may actually betray some sort of Daedalus figure, but not the, the earlier building. Also, I think there's, um, we, we can start to see something of the role and significance of the Kamfala Hilltop and the subsequent court complex during EM. There's a considerable new time depth to this development, um, but I think there's enough to suggest that this served as the main focus of ritual and ceremony for the Knossos community from the end of the Neolithic and throughout EM, and that this shift obvious shift between the residential and then the ceremonial in the, in the later palace. We can see when that, that takes place, and it takes place in stages, and it takes place very early, until, the, uh, until, until such a point when, the, 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 by EM2, the top of the hill, maybe even EM1B, the top of the hill is entirely ceremonial in nature. And so this pattern of multiple investment and periodic transformation over a great time I would like to suggest that resembles other major monumental ceremonial centres, or what people have called temples, like uh, Stonehenge. And so the, I, I would like to argue, in terms of trying to understand, well, why, what, what is the corp complex? Why, why is it ritual or ceremony, whatever? But what, is, what, what actually does it do? Why is it necessary uh, at this time to do that? And I think this is the place where the Knossos community sort of built itself, built it, sort of enacted its own vision of, its, of itself and, and identities and its place in the world. And so, and I think that you can see that changes in investment and in organisation in the court complex are intimately connected with social life and transformation of that uh, community during EM. And as I suggested, uh, these peripheral buildings may map onto the emergence of some sort of corporate unit at around the same time that the settlement is expanding and urbanizing. And I think that, those, that, that, those, that, that the emergence of those groups may be kind of, uh, what's the word, kind of uh, intimately connected with, uh, or they may have facilitated the growth that takes place at that time. 
and that major phases of investment equal uh, major phases of growth in the size and complexity of the Knossos community. So we can see in EM2 and MM1A, and they paralleled in the expansion of the settlement at that time. And so what, do, what can we say about complexity? Well, we can observe certain changes. We can see changes in the size of the community and link that to maybe changes in investment and organisation in the uh, hilltop at, uh, during EM. And it, clearly, the Knossos community grew more complex over many discrete episodes. And so complexity looks like a sort of small incremental changes, like a punctuated equilibria kind of pattern. But obviously, certain clusters of episodes stand out. And EM2A late um, seems to be one of them, and Middleman and one a uh, another where you have a, a massive expansion in the court complex in terms of the, the east wing, but also uh, a more monumental masonry style going at the, uh, uh, at the same time as an explosion in urban growth. And actually in Middleman and 1B, one of the features that changes is that they actually harmonise the facades, as Colin has pointed out, they harmonise the facades in a more monumental uh, masonry uh, style in Middleman and 1B because previously you would have had... Um, a sort of mismatch of sort of different rubble styles, but once the larger sort of masonry style that characterizes the building in Middleman Arm 1A on the east wing, once that uh, emerges, then there's going to be a disjuncture with the rest of the building. And so it's quite logical that in Middleman Arm 1B, they replace the facades around the, the west and north part of the building, and they invest massively in the creation of larger open spaces outside the building. So kind of coping with this much larger community, and we can see that played out in the changes that take place there. OK, but that's another story. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Peter, very much for, for, for this. And I'm, I'm sure it takes a lot of time to uh, put everything together, but I'm sure it's exciting as About well. About 10 years. About <laughs> 10 years, OK. And um, we have any questions, especially from those that know Knossos very well? Come on, guys. He was perfect, but he wasn't that perfect. You have to ask <laughs> no. him something. No. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Hello. Uh, thank you wondering there's absolutely no reason why um, a sort of uh, open court or whatever shouldn't go back to um, a ceramic neolithic is there how do you mean uh, what i mean is that uh, there might you mean, have, you mean uh, for 4000 years or whatever there could very yeah. well have been uh, an open space for gatherings of one sort or, or, or another, so that it, the fact that you can identify this from Final Neolithic 4 onwards is, may, may well be just fortuitous, and it may well go back much earlier. Mm. Well, I think you're absolutely right that open spaces are very important, particularly the periphery of the settlement during the Neolithic is, is, an, is a, an area that seems to have investment. But there's no one space that seems to be privileged in terms of being levelled or terraced, um, in any way, it's more the spaces between houses get used for probably this sort of uh, activity, but they are not, they're not rectangular, in, they're not sort of like aligned in that, in, in that way. They're, they're sort of more informal the way they emerge between houses. And so what happens in FN4 is different, and it doesn't take anything away from what, what you're saying, that open spaces clearly are important, but it's the nature of the way that open space is created and curated, because... These open spaces, they change over time. They don't stay the same in one, one spot. And so houses get built over where there was an open space, and the open space is somewhere else in different phases. And so we don't see this continuity in the use of spaces, other than perhaps on the periphery of the settlement. And even then, with the settlement expanding and the, and the sort of habitation moves around and creates a sort of larger footprint, so even those open spaces get absorbed into the uh, settlement. So I'm, I'm very struck by... This, this establishment of a, of, a, of a space in FN4 that then remains an open space for thousands of years, for more than a thousand years, let's say, at least. As soon as Colin said that, I thought of Jeff Sowell's Axis Mundi Knossos from the beginning. But 
but the difference is, is, is just what you ended on. It's the formalization that's the beginning of your presentation, yeah. and that's really, you know, yeah. that's really interesting. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Paul Connerton's How Societies Remember, his yeah, 1980 book. Too. And this is, this is a beautiful material argument for that process on, you know, yeah. revealing. And I mean, it, it, I guess it, I do have a little question just to go back because there was so much I was busy taking notes. Um, to what extent are you comfortable saying that that earliest formalization in Final Neolithic IV um, might best be understood in terms of uh, communal gatherings, drinking and feasting? Is, is the pottery able to support that? No, no. not at this point. No. No, there's and nothing else that you. No, they they unfortunately kept Evie it clear. Evie doesn't have any seeds that she can contribute. No, I mean, we don't really. If we had an opportunity to dig more, then maybe we could uh, do that sort of thing and get a get better environmental samples and uh, we do all sorts of things actually that might give us more idea about a function. This is the the, the limits of working with old, you know, older excavations. Let's say. Um, and so those would be one of many questions that you would like to pursue with, with, with further excavations. And uh, kind of like what, what I'm trying to do here is to not say, I'm just a point to things that seem to be hinting at something. But so much of this really would be best tested, actually, with some sort of targeted tests. Now that, now that I have a sort of a, a good understanding of the, the subsurface stratigraphy on the hill, then, you know, I'm throwing this stuff out there, but I would like nothing better than to see someone start asking these questions, investigating, and either telling me I'm wrong or, or at least telling me more information about, uh, about what's going on. And so uh, um, it would be nice to be able to do that. But the, to, to answer your question, basically, the, the, the pottery is, is, is there, but there's nothing really in situ or there's, there's odd sherds, but they, from, um, they don't really... It's not like Festos. Festos is fantastic, you, where you've got the spaces and the, and, and, and the things in situ. Um, one imagines that maybe they were dumping it off the terrace, or, and so if we had the opportunity to dig beyond, we might come across caches of material, rather like the palace well, actually. Um, but then again, you've got to try and establish the connection between the space and the, and the thing. So it, unless they leave it in situ, it's very, very difficult, unfortunately. But the hards, I think, are kind of interesting, the fixed hards. Um, if you think about that, and groups having their own hearth, perhaps, and coming back to it over many uh, generations, in fact. Um, I'm not an archaeologist, but I would like to ask you, to ask you if uh, a, an analysis by Carbon-14 of the mortar of, uh, of the mansory could help you to uh, define closely yeah. or more close, anyway, uh, the dates, the chronology, I mean. Well, if we were to do that on the, the walls that I've been presenting, we'd get a date somewhere between yesterday and maybe 50 years ago, because these walls have so been, been so comprehensively um, uh, conserved, let's say, to give it a nice word, um, that we, we wouldn't really have access to the... the, the, the uh, no. Um, but uh, something along those lines perhaps might be possible if we were able to expose uh, an, un an unconserved bit of wall. But uh, no, I, I, I don't think there's much prospect for that uh, at, at the moment. Anybody else? Uh, I'm very curious about uh, this phase uh, with uh, the first Western open uh, yeah. court area. Uh, and you said that there were pits. Yeah. Large pits. Yeah. Uh, can you be more specific about them? And if there's, are they uh, actually dug out? Well, there's, there's yes, the, the, we, we have um, one pit that was excavated um, actually when they were digging the West Court house. It's, it's sort of underneath it. And uh, that, uh, that's the latest one of these pits uh, that's got EM2A early pottery in it. Then just a little bit to the uh, east of the uh, West Court House, a, um, a trench by John Evans came through an EM1 pit. But below that pit, or just slightly overlapping it, there was a, a pit with uh, FN3 material going down very deep. 
and the, and the stratigraphy is horrible. The section is just so complicated. You can see that there's basically it's getting deposits going in and then maybe even individual smaller pits being dug inside. And then, and then something else comes in and then it builds up, builds up, builds up. And then there was a, there's an FN4 phase. And then at some point it's then recut, I think, before the FN4 phase and then filled up. So these are focus of, of activity for a long period of time, potentially uh, that uh, that, 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 that series of pits um, that John Evans excavated east of the West Court House span FN3, FN4, you know, they're, they're going to be six or seven hundred years. Uh, where they're, they're, I mean, think six or seven hundred years kind of like focused on these pits. And on the geophysics, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big round feature south of um, the West Court House in the southern part of the Western Court in an area where... Um, where I know that the Neolithic is, and, uh, and, uh, is, is highly stratified. So it's not going to be part of the, the structures that were, were found further west, but it's going to be uh, something that's at least... I, I thought at first when it, it might be a, another Kalura or something underneath the paving, because it's on, on that sort of size. But I suspect it probably isn't, and that it's, uh, uh, it, may, it, it may be one of these pits. So we do have, excavated, do, do have evidence for them. But the, unfortunately, that again, they're not leaving things in situ. Well, they're not, not, no, they're not leaving primary things in situ. The pottery seems to be quite broken up. Um, and so it's not hard to really get a sense of what's going on. It's not like these sort of a, a nice pit with, uh, with a nice primary deposit in there that might give you a sense of, of, of what the episode of activity was that maybe went with that pit. We've just got this kind of very, very curious digging of large pits and pits inside them um, over a very long period of time that doesn't really make a great deal of sense unless it's some sort of ritual thing. Yeah, uh, Nectarius Karadimas. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming to, to Athens just a little before the, the Greek lectures. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, have you seen other puzzles, uh, the, the, puzzle, the Festos puzzle, uh, the, the Malia puzzle? And I'm just asking that because, well, actually I would agree with your conclusions. If Knossos was uh, unique, but uh, we, I think we have the same structures at Festos and at Malia, yeah. and um, oh, I think at the same time. Uh, mm. so, uh, so I don't understand the, this. Well, I think it's the way. I I, I, don't, I wouldn't have a problem about understanding it. I almost feel I'm very comforted by uh, Simona's Simona's work, for instance, at Festos, because and, and when, when we talk about what we're finding, although. There are differences in the, the, the deposition and the stratigraphy and you know, when certain investments get, take place. But it seems to be kind of like sort of two sides of the same coin. And uh, I, don't, I don't have a problem with, with, with seeing two, two places doing similar-ish things at around the same time that suggest similar in interests in, in similar things. I mean, it's what we see in the later palaces, for instance, between Knossos and Festos. It's, it's sort of same, only different, you know, maybe investment at different times. And so that's sort of, not that I'm a fan of it, but the, the kind of peer polity sort of idea, uh, the idea that the, the centres are kind of aware of what other centres are doing. And Malia is an interesting case, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll hear more about that. Um, but the, the structure... Um, there doesn't seem to have, for instance, a, um, if you believe it at least, I believe it, I think it's on the same, it's on the same alignment as the palace. This is a site that's expanded rapidly, and so it's kind of appropriate that you have this sort of structure at the centre of a sort of urbanising community. And so I, I think that, that the Malia is different, but it's different because of local conditions at Malia, like the, the, the differences, the small differences between Festos and Knossos, it's different local conditions. That, so, so I think it kind of makes sense like that. Oh, next. Peter, right here. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, what is happening in the east slopes of the Kefala Hill? Because it looks like there were no buildings and the, the so-called central building is not actually central. It's actually no. uh, at the edge of a settlement that expands yeah. to the west. And actually everybody that has to go to this court, it has to go through this or next to this building. So perhaps it is central, but in yes, I think maybe central in, in importance rather than central in position. But you're absolutely right. That's 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 a that's a problem really because the the, the great scale of what happened in Middlemore and One A on the east slope has 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 got rid of a lot 
of what was there. So we, we kind of have a, an empty space. Um, there are one or two uh, deposits of, of EM material that sort of escaped disruption. And I didn't present them because you just can't present everything. But there is, there, there is evidence for terracing there in early Minoan, but I can't really say anything about what the nature of that uh, terracing was. But, so there may have been uh, structures, these maybe peripheral buildings or something else, or, or houses, who knows, on terraces on the east slope as well. Um, we just don't have the evidence. It's, there are pockets, and, and maybe if we were able to, to, to dig in certain areas, uh, like below the, uh, the uh, room of the uh, olive press, for instance, um, then we, we might be able to test some of those deposits and, and, and see what they, and maybe pick up some features. I, 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 there's a, a, there's a, a wall sketched on something that goes with a sort of, I think, if I remember right, an EM2B deposit uh, from uh, that area that may, it tells us that there is, there is activity there and there is terracing, but more. And those, those sherds that actually, those early and middle Neolithic sherds that pop up in the EM1B court fill are the most likely source for those is terracing on the east slope. So that might be evidence for uh, terracing from, from, from even in EM1. So I think we can, we can just about say it's sort of got something there, whether it's maybe houses at some point and maybe something uh, different later on, we don't know. But it's all gone from there, essentially, hasn't it? Just pockets, yeah. you know, pockets of material. Um, I mean, because of later terraces. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but below it's the... Uh, much, it's been, the, the, the east slope has been much more remodeled, let's yeah. say, than any other part yeah. of the hill. I mean, to the extent that, of, I mean, as you well know, that the, uh, the domestic quarter, the western part of that, is cut right into the natural. And so when we were doing the, the bedrock interpolation, we had to just leave that date, uh, leave those points out because uh, it's, it's removed. But east of uh, the, the eastern part of the domestic quarter, there, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe a bit north of there, there is evidence for maybe some sort of EM terrace. Um, Uh, Jim Wright, I'm just reacting actually to Nectarios' observation. Uh, if you put this in a larger frame of the Aegean, then it's interesting that in pushing back the beginning of this uh, mm -hmm. process of centralization around these centers, pushing it back to such an early date, then in a sense it leaves the mainland, for example, far behind. Not far behind, but it leaves the mainland in, in an interesting way. Yeah. Because you can't say that about final Neolithic, early Helladic one, mm. um, and then the long sequence of early Helladic one, you really have to wait later. And so it raises mm -hmm. interesting questions about a comparative framework mm. for the development of centralized, whatever yeah. you want to call these early polities. To, we have to get down to the corridor house probably before we see something that's, yeah. you know, and I mean, we, we could try to push that, Daniel Pullen has pushed that back into early EH2. Right. But we can't okay. push it back into EH1, yeah. I don't think. So it raises, I think, really mm. interesting questions about what's going on at Crete and whether there's any... Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't suppose, and others can comment on that, what would be the relationship between Crete, let's say, and EM1, EM2A, yeah. to yeah. things that are happening both in the islands, we can see some of that, but probably yeah. the mainland is off. And, and it may have to, a lot to do with... the. The rather severe climatic conditions. I mean, we're, you know, the mm. southern Greece is really a, a desert area, and yeah. Crete has a lot more probably yeah. climatic and, and resource opportunities that mm -hmm. can produce the, yeah. the surpluses that, that make this happen. I don't know. It's just very interesting. Well, yeah, that may have something to do with with with, with explaining why Crete kicks on at the end after after in the latter part of EB two and doesn't really seem to show any sort of. Uh, disruption or hiatus, you know. You wonder what would have happened to corridor houses if, it, on the mainland, if they'd have been allowed to develop, you know, if there hadn't been sort of this sort of whatever you want to call it, sort of uh, collapse or whatever. Um, uh, no, I don't like that either. But, <laughs> but kind of a change. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't kick on in the same way that the that, that, that creek does. Maybe maybe it stays the same, but it doesn't kick on in in that way. And. and I mean, recently I've sort of got interested in southwestern Turkey a bit more and, and with, with, the, with the work coming out of there. And there's a place like Karatash, for instance, which is a sort of 
sort of mound with a sort of structure on top and terraces around it and a town below and sort of strange deposits on there. And that's from EB1 uh, there. So maybe there's, there's, there's similarish things happening, same only different, you know, but it's a com comparable changes in complexity taking place there perhaps to, uh, to Crete. Yeah. But I was surprised when my, my building turned, and the big court turned out to be EM1B. I would never would have predicted that. Um, I'd like to say something uh, related to what Jim said. Uh, what does it really tell us, what you've discovered um, about the complexity of the society, the function mm -hmm. of this court area, compared to the early Hellenic 2A corridor houses? Because I think that the implications of the corridor houses are far more serious and imply, I'm using the same word here, a much more developed organization mm. yeah. than what we see in Crete at the same time, mm -hmm. including the ceiling system and everything, mm -hmm. and the building. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would like to ask you, actually, I was thinking about it, what is your uh, overview? How would you explain the social processes yeah. Um, if it was a, was it a communal thing? Um, the eventual emergence, because as regards the two, mainland and Manan Crete at this time, I still think that the mainland was much more obviously, at least because we don't have much, uh, developed towards, again, towards centralization. Mm -hmm. um, what, how do you see it? I mean, I didn't see any centralization mm -hmm. from what you said. How do you imagine that? What do you, what do you, how would you define centralization? I mean, the... Uh, Economical, what? political, um, social, whatever. Okay. I mean, you've got an open space. Let's see, you've yeah. got buildings all around. Yeah. You don't know the role of these buildings or the size of them. You haven't got any elite objects in there. Well, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would say that the... Uh, I fl it flashed up and flashed away, and I didn't have a chance to point it out, but the... The uh, Egyptian uh, stone, stone vases, which we've always been wondering about. Um, you know, they're not, they're not, I mean, they, they occur in cemeteries and they uh, occur in, uh, in houses as well. But uh, Knossos has always been recognized to, as, as a little bit unusual for having um, so many. And of course, the context of those has been uh, disputed. And some people like to explain these as, as later sort of relics that were uh, got into deposits, but in terms of going through um, the the old excavations and and, and and puzzling out context, I think that one can make a case that uh, several of these are in EM deposits. There's 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 several that come actually from the EM3 uh, fill behind the northwest uh, terrace, um, and I think it makes sense to think of them as early Bronze Age arrivals. Um, however, you want to explain that. So I, I, I don't think we're, 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 we're lacking in nice objects. Um, uh, we're, we're just lacking in actually, if we had, we had better deposits, then we might be able, I mean, the thing is what we got is, a, is mainly we got fill deposits. And if you argue that the fill deposits that are going in, in some of these later episodes are from the central, or from the area of this building, they're use deposits, then you, maybe you can, as, as actually Peter Day and David Wilson have sort of, uh, sort of try to argue with these deposits that they're, 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 they're sort of unusual in, in certain ways. Um, but we're, we're, we're scratching around. I mean, that's the, that's the problem. What, what gives me a lot of hope, actually, is the, is the North Portico uh, building, and I would really love to, to, to find out more about that, because that, 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 that very large pithos and the ceiling, is, it, that, that's our only deposit from one of these structures. And it's, it's showing something unusual. And Peter Day and Devil Wilson have already looked at that pottery and without, without uh, seeing it in this context, but they, made, they noted that one of the things that was unusual about it was it seemed to be very technologically homogenous and unlike uh, deposits they see from houses, on the Westcott House, for instance. And, um, and so there are, they already noticed that there were features of that that were, were a little bit unusual. And then you throw in the pithos and, and the building. and the, So if we had more of those, it would be... Uh, would be nice. Um, but in terms of trying to answer what have we got here, yeah. I, the way I would, I think that y if you see, uh, I, I like this idea of corporate 
groups or some sort of larger group larger than the household because throughout the Neolithic you've got households and households maybe even getting together in larger groups but it, I think this is the kind of the social change maybe that is actually driving the expansion of these settlements, driving urbanisation and the, the court complex is a way of integrating these groups uh, in a ceremonial space and I, and I think you have a sort of almost like a sort of mass participation society where uh, everyone has to find their place in the in the in the community and the place where they do that and they learn their roles in relation to other people and who gets to walk where and that sort of thing is played out. It's actually this is where they make their their so, their social structure, their social their, their their identities, their their social relations are performed in the in in the in in on the hill and at various times and so. You can, you can maybe read into the space and the, the way space structures people's movement and that sort of thing. That, that's perhaps the way you can build the most uh, strong case for what's going on in, in society. So I see it as a sort of integrative, ceremonial, it's kind of like a temple sort of thing. <laughs> and how does the new do the palaces, though, to if you made um, Well, I think you, spatially, again, you could say that uh, there's, there's a very obvious... Uh, connection and evolution, a, a sort of continuous evolution. And I mean, the problem then is is is, is what do you? I mean, there are, it's a terminology issue, and I, I favour a more neutral term. Uh, I actually quite like to break down it into sort of like you have courts and open spaces, and think of what people were arguing about uh, Myrtos uh, Funokorifi and that space there. And I think courts are something that are part of the uh, Minoan. And, and also the Neolithic uh, sort of lexicon of ritual, really. And then certain buildings get associated with those, and you have a court building. And then certain, certain complex, large communities, you have a court complex. And, uh, and, uh, but then at some point, we have this term palace, which we invented. And um, we have to, do we, yeah, when, when does the palace, I think that's a bit of a sort of cul-de-sac, really. Let's... Let's, let's kind of, I mean, we can, we can argue when, I mean, the, the, what I'm always struck by is the, the massive change in the building in MM3B and, uh, and the rebuilding that goes on there. And maybe that's when we can call that a palace. I don't know. <coughs> Thank you very much, Peter and Nikos Papadimitriou. I'm not very much familiar with all these periods in Crete, but from, from uh, what you describe, I wonder, uh, you said that you have this development that you described and Simona has a similar or comparable development in uh, Pestos, while Malia appears uh, uh, in, in a different thing. Uh, I was thinking that if you have something like a peer polity situation, as you said earlier, wouldn't you expect some of these sites to fail develop into a, a different, a, a next stage of complexity, let's say. To, 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 to fail, you say. To fail, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, aside that you wouldn't have all these massive reconstructions that you have mm -hmm. in Knossos or uh, so, and also uh, aside that you would expect to find all the things that you have in negative and you do such a great mm -hmm. work to reveal in positive, I mean, in real remains. Yeah. And I don't know, we may have such kind of things, but I'm, I'm asking if, if, if this is a reasonable thinking or if we already have this thing, yet, I don't know which is possible. Yeah, well, I, I think, I mean, this, this is why I quite like the idea of breaking down the, seeing the evolution at Knossos as a way of actually um, creating a more refined typology of these, 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 these sites, these, these, these um, uh, you know, Knossos sort of defines a very early phase, and which we date to Neolithic there, where you've just got an open space. And places with open spaces uh, surrounded by houses, you know, think of Myrtos Funokori Fi, that's a later example. Um, and I think um, in terms of, I would expect to find, yes, places that were stuck at maybe one level. Uh, they, they, they maybe have a, a, an open space, a court or whatever, but they never develop a building because they're just still remain too small, like Myrtos, perhaps. But then there's a, there's a phase where you maybe might have a court building or, or a special house or something next to an open space. And one thinks of Vasiliki, uh, maybe in, in that context. I know, you know uh, that, that, that has been debated about, you know, whether, are those houses or, or, or are they something else? But you've got an, 
a nice paved area at sort of uh, EM2B uh, date, if I'm, if, I, if I'm right, um, and, and sort of buildings associated with it. So perhaps that's an, another example of something that didn't kick on uh, like other places uh, did. But I would expect yeah, to find more examples of, of places at a, maybe a lower level of, of development. One wonders about the, um, the, the Palais Castro, for instance, and, the, and the, the big masonry that was, was found there in the early excavations, and you know, Keith Brannigan pointed to this, and others have debated about whether it is or it isn't, but you know, maybe Palais Castro would be another site where we could hopefully find uh, um, something like this if we, if we got lucky. Last chance before the glass of wine. No? Peter, thank you very, very much. And uh, I hope that you bring us luck that we stepped into 2015 in our lecture series with, uh, with you. If we don't go well, it's on you, you know that. <laughs> so uh, I think it's going with the publication so we see all this written and uh, the Neolithic oh, yes. Knossos as well. Okay, thank you very much again, thank you. Thank you.